All right, guys. Welcome to uh, welcome to the Daily Word verse by verse. Grab your Bibles and follow along as we continue in our study in First uh, Timothy chapter five. We are uh, talking. <clears throat> We're going to get into chapter five, and Paul is going to get into some things. Um, I wish I had had this wisdom when I was younger and in terms of how to deal with people. When I was younger, I was quite direct. Uh, I was, um, uh, I would say really what was on my mind. And unlike, like, you know, some people say that they like, for example, when the president speaks his mind. They didn't like when I spoke my mind, especially when it came to God's word. Well, I want to get into, uh, again, Paul and um, and dealing with, um, you know, just dealing with um, certain situations in the church. So chapter 5 and in verse 1, he says... Do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, with all propriety, the younger women as sisters. Now, you'll remember back in chapter 4, <coughs> he had said, um, uh, chapter 4, remember he said to do not let anyone despise your youth, but um, be an example. Be an example of speech. Be an example of love, conduct, behavior, right? Be an example. So when he says right here, now this is putting this direction. And, he's, and he says, don't rebuke an older man. So as a younger minister, what his disposition and you remember in chapter 3, he says, do not appoint a novice to the position of elders or that kind of leadership position. And one reason why he said is because they could be lifted up with pride. So as a young, younger man, Paul says, don't rebuke an older person. And, and what he means by rebuke is the way you should correct people. The way you should approach people, not heavy-handed, not haughty and haughtiness. So he says, do not rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father. In other words, don't come to him in the sense with your finger pointed out at him. You should do this. You ought to, you know. Um, so he says, don't rebuke an older man, but exhort him as a father. Younger men as brothers. Older women as mothers. And with all propriety. And he says, and younger women as sisters. Now, some of your uh, translations tag on with all purity. Uh, when we get into those kinds of translations like that, some people will take issue, let's say, with the, uh, the Holman Christian Standard Translation, for example, as a verse to the King James. They would take issue with not putting that in. Um, again, to me, that's something for the scholars to hash out. Um, what the Holman Christian Translation would state is they looked at the most modern available transcripts and manuscripts in which then they made the decision is to add that in. It's really no big deal, but some people see it as one. All right. But um, really what this describing to in all the classifications is as a minister, we clothe ourselves with humility, gentleness, because the aim is not to lord it over God's people but we are always to um, seek to remember in, in, in 2 Corinthians when we studied that 
that that Paul says that we've been given authority to build you up. So it's never to lord it over you, never to tear down, but to build you up. So this is how he, their approach is. You know, this is you have to you you, you know um, because Lord knows there are people that will certainly take ex they, they, there are people that didn't like the fact that Timothy was young, and then young telling him what to do, and he could. He, you know, so it's funny because the elder people, you would say, who is this young person to tell me? The younger people would say the same thing. Man, you just like us. How can you tell us, right? The attitude, right? So you have that. All right. Now, um, in chapter, I mean, verse 3, we're going to kind of read through this. He talks about uh, support of the riddles. Let me... And the takeaway for us today, because he's going to give some guidelines, um, the early church um, had a support system wherewith they would take care of the needy widows, okay? And he's going to give some guidelines for that. Um, the takeaway for us is, how are we to do that today? Now, some churches today... Uh, they get into um, nursing homes. Um, that's kind of a tricky situation because uh, you get the city involved with that. You get um, 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 you get the. Um, I mean, that's a tricky situation. Nursing home, but you know, a church building a nursing home. That's a whole di different thing. What they would do is they would take upon those widows who are in need. And if you kind of go back in the book of Acts, you see where the care of people was always on the minds of the church. It first started off, remember, with everyone giving, selling, and putting them all their, their, their goods in one pot. And then uh, they would distributed to everyone who had needs. Um, God didn't necessarily tell them to do that. They did it. And as we see in chapter 6, that kind of, as the church grew, the growing pains of the church, they had to readjust. Paul had to, you know, we, we dealt with that in, in um, his letter to the Thessalonians, that there were people who didn't want to work. And he said, well, if you don't want to work, if you will not work, you should eat. So, um, the care of people, and oftentimes when we talk about this, in the sense, the care of people, and then what does it mean when we have the care of people? That this is very, very important to understand. Um, the um, and again, I think Paul gives us some very good guidelines. So uh, verse three says, "Support widows who are generally widows." But if any widow has children or grandchildren, they must learn to practice godliness towards their own family first and to repay their parents. For this pleases God. Now, before I go on, I want to I show you something about this. Because Carl is going to make a very strong statement uh, about those who do not take care of their own. And keep in mind, this is in the context. But I want to read something. I'm going to go to Mark's Gospel. This is Mark's Gospel, chapter 7. <clears throat> and this is something Jesus was confronting. Okay. And I'm taking this story. I want to read this. This is something. Uh, I'm going to pick up, start reading in um, verse number 9. He said, he also said to them, you completely invalidate God's command in order to maintain your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And whoever speaks evil of your father and mother, he must be put to death. Now, when saying this here, um, he is going to give really a definition of what it means to honor your mother and father. So in other words, it's not just respect. But Jesus is going to add something to this that's kind of quite interesting. 
So he says, uh, verse 11, but you say, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever benefit you might have received from me is Corbin, or that is uh, a gift committed to the temple. And you no longer let him do anything for his father or mother. You revoke God's word by your traditions you have handed down and you do many other similar things. Now, Jesus just kind of gave a definition of honor. And part of that was taking care of, the, of, of, of their parents when they get older. And what would happen is that the Pharisees, in order to receive gifts or receive the money, they kind of found a way, right? Kind of a happy medium. So what they said, what they did was, it was hypocritical, and, and as Jesus busted them out, he said, you were wrong. What Jesus said was, uh, here's what you guys are doing. The Pharisees to say, if you had a, a hundred thousand dollars, and 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 so the Pharisees would say, I tell you what, give us twenty thousand dollars and keep the rest. And you could say it's Corbin or a gift committed to God. And that way they was, they was getting around taking care of their parents. So my point I wanted to bring from that is notice he says honoring your father and your mother. The definition part of that is again caring for which includes but not limited to the financial support once your parents get of age and maybe they can't take care of themselves. Now, what Paul is referring to here, then, he says, then, um, uh, that's why, and notice he says, send them to their family first, verse 3 again, support widows who are generally widows. So that's a key right there. He says, but if a widow has children or grandparents, they must learn to practice godliness towards their children, their family first, and to repay their parents, for this pleases God. Now, another thing about that verse, if you look at this, another thing about this verse is again notice the church wasn't set up to be a um, it wasn't set up to be a um, welfare system in other words he's taking care they gladly took care of the truly needy but notice what he says here um, Make sure you go to your family first. Make sure you exhaust every other avenue before you come to the church. Now, as he's going to say, the reason why he's saying that is so that we can be able to take care of widows indeed. Now, let me just say this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this quickly and I'll, I'll move on. A lot of people think that when I, when I give, when they give to the church, they give tithes and they give their offerings to the church, um, oftentimes people think that that entitles them to something and it doesn't you remember it's a gift that you're given and once you give it it is then theirs so just like if, if somebody gives you an envelope let's say they give you a hundred dollars that doesn't mean that they now are entitled to occupy your time or come over and eat out of your refrigerator or whatever but a lot of times people kind of think this about the church Okay, well, I pay my tithes there, so the church is obligated to. No, it's not. Now, that's not to say that the church shouldn't help if they can or if they choose. My point is, you're not entitled to it just on the basis of because I, I pay tithes. Okay. Uh, notice that Paul sent them to their family first. He said, now, exhaust that avenue. I often say sometimes when it comes to benevolence, you got to be really careful. Um, I know sometimes people will call and ask you to borrow money. If they think you have money, people will say, hey, can you loan me money? People think that you can loan money. Well, you know what? Um, let them exhaust every other avenue before they come to you. And let me just tell you this. And I kid you not when I say this. There are people that were asked to borrow money from you when they got thousands sitting in a savings account when they have a retirement account okay so that and 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 so people will ask you no and my thing is no no 
tap those resources first before you come to the church and that's the way it should be all right so um verse five he says the real widows is left all alone has put her hope in god and continues night and day in her petitions and prayers however she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives command this also so they won't be blamed but if anyone doesn't switch here but if anyone doesn't provide for his own that is his own household he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever so he puts the burden again on the family should take care of them first see the family should take care of them first then the church and um um, hey, Sister Erling, good to see you. I just see you note here. God bless you too. But the the, the, the family should take care of them first. And then notice this thing is that if, if a man doesn't, if one doesn't take care of their own, he says, notice, this is kind of a hard thing too. Notice he said, if, if one doesn't take care of his own, he is worse than an infidel and is denied the faith. Okay. He is denied the faith. All right, um, verse 9 says, No widow should be placed on the official list unless she is at least 60 years old, has been the wife of one husband, and is well known for good works. That is, she has brought up children, shown hospitality, and washed uh, the saints' feet, helped the afflicted, and devoted herself to every good work. So, they weren't just supposed to put anyone on there either. That they weren't just supposed to put any any um, you know again anybody just kind of kind of show up. One of the worst things that the welfare system did to people in our country, especially, is made people worthless. Especially when you get into the generational um, the generational. Um, uh, welfare to me one of the worst things um, th th because they had no 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 worth no value no self-esteem about themselves and they made it so easy that you can just go and just sign up at the and to me kind of the height of it in the in festival going to the 70s and 80s it, 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 and it, it, people would just go and just sign up be on welfare live off of um you know live off of uh again the county as they call it okay in fact back in the 70s there was a term called mother's day and you would see people let's say in october like today in october they'd go oh it's mother's day and be like what 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 is mother's day and that meant welfare day check day okay but it shouldn't be that easy so he says right here, first of all, a person should be totally without means. Notice he said 60 years old. And then a person who has had good works. So it wasn't just supposed to be anybody. So if a person was 60 years old, but then was a horrible person, he said, don't put them on the, the permanent uh, support. They had to almost in the sense you look, you go back to chapter three when he gave kind of qualifications for uh, the deacons and the uh, elders. In other words, they had to be a person of good works. Uh, verse 11 says, But refuse to enroll younger widows, for when they have drawn away from Christ by desire, they want to marry, and they will receive condemnation because they have renounced their original pledge. Um, let me see here. Oh. <clears throat> and at that time, uh, and at the same time, they learn to be idle, going from house to house. Uh, they're not only idle, but they are also gossiped and busybodies, saying things they shouldn't. Um, I, again, this kind of goes back to when you give people free money. Now think about this: with no means, with no end to it, this is what happens. Okay, this is what happens. Oh, okay. 
Verse 13, therefore I want the younger women to marry, have children, manage their households, and give the adversary no opportunity to accuse us. For some have already turned away to follow Satan. And for, if any believing woman has widows in their family, if any believing woman has uh, widows in, in her family, she should help them. And the church should not be burdened so that it could be it could help those who are genuinely widows. So really, Paul's point here is not that he's being hard nosed, uh, but that really what he is saying is that they want to be always in a position to help those who are, are in need. Now, as I said, a lot of people have depending on kind of what their background is. They can have a lot of strange, um, to me, ideals about, um, they can have a lot of strange ideals about money, how they wish to receive it. And what Paul is saying right here is that, okay, look, I'm not going to get in your business, but here is our qualifications for taking someone in on and putting them on a permanent support role. That's basically what this is, that they were taking care of of the widows and that, those with qualification, godly people committed to Christ. And notice he says too, which is kind of interesting, that younger women widows, he said, to get married. Now that's a it hits it's a glance it's a passing statement. But notice he says that hey, you know what? I would that they would just um, uh, that's not what I want. I, I would I would that they would just get married. Notice he says that they would get married, have children, guide the house. Um, and that's and and again, don't put them on. Now, kind of and don't put them on the on the church role. In our day, we would say, get a job, get married, or get a job. Right? Get a married, or get a job, get a career. Um, but don't put them on a, a support, especially younger ones. I, I can, I, I tell you, we can look at the welfare system and what it did to the worth of people to, to, to show that that's not good. Uh, I personally believe that no healthy person should be on welfare. None. I think no healthy person should be on welfare. All right, so... I'm not going to spend too much time on this because different churches, our our culture, by the way, is set up so differently that even if you if if you send this into one to apply what Paul just said literally, then you could probably put this on and add this on. Paul would send them to, okay. Uh, Paul would say, "Do you have social security? Um, what type of um, uh, assisted living?" He would point them there, and then, and then if if there's no um, if there's no um, 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 other means, then yes, we will take care of you. Now, of course, today I don't know of any churches that even have this system that they're taking care of their elderly anyway. That they do defer them to the county. Now, is that right? Is that wrong? You know, you can be the judge. I will say this, however. Um, when it comes to benevolence, when it comes to mercy, it gets tricky because you never, ever can demand mercy. And this is in the area of mercy. You can never demand mercy from anything. You can never demand that someone gives you something. So you, can, you can't demand that um, a church do for you okay that's you know um all right let's see uh, okay now another interesting thing about this verse 15 uh oh here was an kind of thing about this too that Paul kind of um, the criteria was they were not they weren't supposed to get married, and it seems that they were supposed to take some kind of commitment to that. I don't know if it was a vow or whatever, but some kind of commitment to that. 
I, I'm not going to la belabor that. I'm trying to sleep, go back. Um, I, I'm not going to belabor this too much. Um, but in verse 11, but refused to enroll younger widows for when they are drawn away from Christ uh, by desire, they want to marry. And that's where they receive uh, condemnation because they have renounced their original pledge. Now, it seemed like there was, um, they weren't supposed to get married. And of course you wouldn't, you know, and if, in, in a sense, you don't want them to be married and then also being, being taken care of by the church. And remember, his whole point of being the strict is that um, you can be able to take care of those who truly need. And that kind of weeds that out. All right. Um, now, here's a very interesting. Okay, let me go back. Uh, let me add All right, verse 17. He says, the elders who are the elders who are good leaders should be considered worthy of an ample honorarium, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain, and the worker is worthy of his rage. Now, there is much discussion on what a minister should receive in terms of his pay. Okay, there is much discussion. In other words, there are people who think should should minister prosper, should ministers receive large salaries. Okay, and here's my thing: um, that all depends, right? Now, notice what Paul is uh, saying here. Um, Go back to one page here. He says, an elder, the elders who are good leaders should be considered worthy of an ample honorarium. Now, I want to, I should have done this, prepared this, because I'm thinking about this now. But, um, I am actually going to, you can't see this. I am going to read this same scripture here. Uh, but I'm going to read it from the King James Bible and especially since I had just, um, when I gave you the scripture in, in Mark, when he says honor, that the word honor here has to do with more than just paying homage to or giving respect to, um, let me pull this up on this. Uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna read this from the King James. Uh, uh, all right. So verse 17 again. Okay. So. Again, I'm using the Holman Christian Standard Bible, but verse 17 says the elders who are good leaders should be considered worthy of an ample honorarium. Now, I'm going to read this from the King James. Same thing, verse 17. Let the elders who will who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. Now, notice the term double honor. And that's the point. Now, remember... In, in Mark's in that, in that passage in Mark where he, he says honor your father and mother which is really one of the Ten Commandments in other words we just kind of got a expanded definition of what it means to honor in other words it's more than just to pay homage to but it is also has to do with some money okay all right has to do with money now so his Notice the standard here. He says that those who rule well, those who are actually faithful to the calling, notice he says that they should be compensated. And notice he said ample, King James, double honor. And so 
Um, the, and here's my thing. The, the idea that a pastor lives well. And we have uh, pastors who... Um, there are pastors out there who... Um, they're millionaires. They brag about being millionaires. They... Um, uh, <laughs> they 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 drive very expensive cars, um, fly around in helicopters, Lear jets. They do have palatial mansions. Here's my thing: I do not care uh, about that. I don't care. I don't care if you know minister so and so has a Bentley and other minister so and so has a helicopter and minister so and so you know. Uh, fly around in, in the Learjet. I, I don't care. Notice what Paul says right here. Those who labor, those who are ruling well, then they are worthy of compensation. And it's not the first time Paul talked about this. Remember in, in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he says, it is right for ministers to be compensated. Nowhere in Scripture where it ever says that a minister was supposed to live poor. And and that's sort of sad because you do have um you have ministers you you have and, and again this we can go back centuries where this kind of idea developed that um, poverty equals piety, and that's that's just I don't know where they got that from. That poverty equals piety, okay. And um, as we can see, this scripture doesn't say that. Now there are scriptures when you look at Jesus, and it says that Jesus is poor, and it uses that language. However, if you go back and you look at the gospel, what does it mean to be poor? In other words, really, what does it mean to be poor? And think about this, that when it says that Jesus was poor, okay, in comparison to coming from heaven, in comparison to the Son of God, okay, but when you look at and you study the life of Jesus, he, wasn't, he, he didn't beg for money. Um, he wasn't you know, he wasn't, um, and it said he wasn't destitute. And think about this: that not only was he not destitute, but he took care of twelve, 12 at least, right? He took care of at least twelve men, and then presumably their families. Now we know that the Bible tells us that also people gave into his ministry. People of means gave into his ministry, supported his ministries. All right. And um, so um, the idea that so but Jesus, his life was not it was atypical uh, because he had a very, of course, extreme, narrow, laser focused purpose. That's why he didn't marry, didn't have a family and all that. He came. He was here for only 33 years of his life. So, um, but while he was here, again, he was never destitute. And if you stop and you think about this, he um, fed over, what, on one occasion, 5,000 men, another occasion, 4,000 men. And if you count the women and children, that number swells to somewhere close to 20,000. If you think about it, easy estimate. Um, so my point is he wasn't destitute. Um, now I'm going to get more into this in the next study. I'm going to come back to this and I'm going to get more into this in the next study. Um, and again, I, I, I'm talking a little bit about ministers' salary. Again, like I say, I don't care that ministers, what they, how they live and all that. That's not going to be the issue with me. The fact that, you know, okay, you got a house with a helicopter pad and, you know, a palatial 
one minister has his own airport. Now, here's my point. I don't care. I really don't care. He has a, another minister has a compound with five palatial houses on the compound within there. Here's my point. I don't care. I really don't. And I say that with authenticity. I don't care. Um, there are valid reasons sometimes why ministers live that way. Okay? Some ministers come to the ministry, they are already millionaires. And of course, there are those ministers that are frauds. <laughs> and we'll get into that in our next lesson. We're, and then, again, balance it out again for what Scripture says. All right, we'll pick it up again back at verse number 17. We'll pick it up again uh, in our next study. All right, guys, I'll see you in the next study. Okay.